In the last episode of The Atomic Bomb, we examined the underlying principles of the Hiroshima bomb and how the weapons-grade uranium in it, the U-235, was made. In this episode, we'll be looking at how the bomb itself was put together, its essential components, and how it actually worked. Before we get going, don't forget to subscribe to my channel and hit that thumbs up button if you like this video. Thanks. The Hiroshima atomic bomb was a gun-type bomb. It literally had a gun barrel inside it, six feet long. It worked, very simply, by firing a subcritical projectile of uranium-235 into a U-235 target to form a critical mass to initiate a chain reaction and set off an explosion. The amount of uranium used totaled 141 pounds, or approximately 64 kilograms. This was all the weapons-grade uranium that the Manhattan Project had produced up to the summer of 1945. All of it went into this one bomb. The U-235 was cast into a total of 15 rings in two different sizes. The larger rings, nine altogether, were six and a quarter inches across and had a four-inch hole in the middle. They were sandwiched together to form a cylinder. Length, 7 inches. Total weight, 85 pounds. This was the projectile. There was a tungsten carbide tamper attached to the back, which I'll explain about in a moment. The uranium rings and the tamper were all held together by an outer sheathing of copper. The whole thing would have looked like a big tin can. The smaller rings, six in total, were sandwiched together in the nose of the bomb to form the target. The one-inch hole in them was to accommodate the post that they were bolted onto that held them together. Length, seven inches, the same as the projectile. Diameter, four inches, the same as the center hole in the projectile, so that the two masses would fit snugly together. Total weight? 56 and a half pounds. All these rings, incidentally, varied in thickness. No two were exactly alike. This was because they were made piecemeal over many months as weapons-grade uranium was slowly accumulated. Let me just jump in here with a visual aid. Imagine the rear projectile fired down the gun barrel into the target to form a single mass of uranium, a supercritical mass, in that fraction of a microsecond, before the bomb blew itself apart, that mass of uranium-235 would have been about the size of this can of coffee. And it would have weighed, again, 141 pounds, or about 64 kilograms. Okay, so now it's time to set this thing off. The whole idea of a gun-type bomb is that it brings two subcritical masses of uranium together to form a supercritical mass. Projectile, target, bring them together, boom. Bear in mind, though, that this has to be done fast. That's why a gun was used to shoot the projectile at high speed into the target. The actual firing mechanism used cordite charges which propelled the projectile down the barrel at just under 1,000 feet per second. It had to travel less than six feet, so it would have taken only about seven milliseconds to reach the end of the gun barrel and mate with the target. Okay, so the projectile has reached the front of the gun barrel to mate with the target. A heavy anvil and a mass of forged steel, here, now stops it dead in its tracks. All this weight of steel in the bomb's nose is there to physically hold the uranium together. Not for long, of course, because a chain reaction now has started. An exponential release of energy is building up that in a microsecond, 
a millionth of a second will blow the uranium and the bomb apart. Boom! The moment that happens, the chain reaction stops. It happens so fast that only a small fraction of the uranium has had a chance to fission, barely 1%. The rest is blasted out in every direction, scattered all across the sky, totally wasted. It never gets a chance to fission at all. A great deal of the thought that went into the Hiroshima bomb was directed at this problem. How do you get the highest percentage of uranium-235 atoms to fission before the bomb blows itself apart? If you could hold back the chain reaction until the last moment, then speed it up in that microsecond before the bomb blew itself to smithereens, you could get, say, 2% of the uranium to fission instead of just 1%, and you could double the power of your bomb. The builders of the little boy bomb came up with three methods to accomplish this. First, they coated the inner surface of the uranium rings in the projectile and the outer surface of the uranium target with a metal known as cadmium, which absorbs neutrons. This served to hold back the chain reaction when the projectile was fired into the target. By absorbing the initial burst of neutrons as the two pieces of uranium came together, it held back the chain reaction for just long enough for them to fully assemble, to fully mate into a critical mass. The second method involved little nubs of polonium and beryllium, barely the size of a peanut, that were attached to the back of the uranium projectile, here. When the projectile was fired into the target, the impact caused the polonium and beryllium to smash together and react with each other, a reaction that released a burst of neutrons to add to the neutrons coming from the fissioning U-235. These nubs were called initiators because they helped initiate the chain reaction. They helped get it going and sped it up. Finally, the third method involved the tamper. It was made of tungsten carbide, extremely dense. When the projectile was fired into the target, the smaller tamper attached to its rear plugged the hole so that the supercritical uranium mass was completely enveloped. Its purpose was to reflect neutrons back into the uranium as the chain reaction gets going. They can't escape. The tamper bounces them back in, making the reaction faster and fiercer in that one microsecond before the explosion. These various components that we've been talking about, the gun barrel, the firing mechanism, the uranium projectile and target, the tamper, the nose assembly, they were the essential core of the Hiroshima bomb. This inner assembly with the bomb's outer casing and electronics removed. This is what really mattered. This is all that was really needed for the bomb to work. If the Americans had been willing to launch a suicide mission, they could have simply loaded this inner assembly into an aircraft, flown it to Japan, and manually detonated it over Hiroshima, and it would have worked just fine. The airplane and the crew would have been vaporized, but the bomb itself would have worked just fine. If the Japanese had developed this weapon, this is likely how they would have used it, as a kamikaze-style weapon, a suicide weapon. Sacrificing the crew to manually detonate the bomb over the target would have been preferable from the Japanese perspective because it would have avoided a lot of the complexity and made the bomb more of a sure thing. But of course, the Americans didn't go in for suicide missions. So that's where everything else about the Hiroshima bomb came in. The outer casing, the tail fin assembly, the mass of electronics and complex wiring, the proximity fuse. All these additional components were not needed for the weapon to function. They were added to the design so that the bomb could be released at high altitude and left to self-detonate when it reached 2,000 feet over the target, 
giving the bomber crew time to get safely away. It amounted to adding a lot of complexity to what was otherwise a relatively simple weapon. Complexity that increased the chance of failure. The risk. In the next episode of The Atomic Bomb, we'll be accompanying Little Boy out to the Pacific in the summer of 1945, and we'll be going aboard the B-29 bomber Enola Gay on the trip to Japan. As we'll see, the first military use of an atomic bomb could have turned out very different. The mission to bomb Hiroshima could have easily been a colossal failure. I'm Sam Hawley. See you next time.